Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining me. Welcome to the official start of our final unit of microeconomic theory. So the first thing I wanna do is give kind of a big picture idea of what we're gonna do with our final unit, our last only two and a half weeks of this semester. So where we left off at the end of last unit is that we built this argument that under certain conditions, competitive market equilibria are Pareto efficient, right? Essentially what we said is that when we have three conditions met, right, no price, no market power, no externalities, and no private information, then competitive market equilibria aren't necessarily gonna lead us to the best outcome socially, but they're gonna lead us to an outcome that doesn't have any clear preferable alternatives from everybody's perspective. Right, an outcome where you can't make one person better off without making another person worse off. What we're gonna be doing in this unit is digging a little more to these failure states of a competitive equilibrium. We're gonna be thinking a little bit more carefully about what goes wrong when these assumptions are violated and how that's gonna affect economic outcomes. So this is gonna play two roles. The first is that it's gonna help us to get this deeper understanding, this more nuanced understanding of the power of markets and the, and the role of markets in shaping economic outcomes. The other thing is it's gonna let us play with some pretty cool tools that have a broad variety of applications. So we're gonna do things like dive into game theory. Um, we're gonna spend time when we talk about market power, talking in a more careful and nuanced way about the decisions of firms than we've done in the past, all of this should be pretty fun and pretty interesting. Okay, so this is kind of very big picture what we're doing in this unit. What we're doing today is we're gonna start thinking about market power, right? So this is where we're gonna start. And effectively what I mean by market power is a firm has market power when it has some ability to set its own price, right? So when we've talked about competitive firms, Right, we've essentially argued that if I'm a competitive firm, I can sell as much or as little output as I want at some market price, but I can't sell any output at all at a price below that market price. Right? In other words, if I'm making soybeans, there's some, you know, soybeans cost, you know, $58 a ton. I can sell as many soybeans as I want at $58 a ton. I can't sell a single soybean at a price of $59 a ton. And of course, I never would sell a soybean at a price of $57 a ton, right? Firms have market power, and the reason that I can't do that, right, is because there's tons of other soybean manufacturers doing exactly the same thing as me, just as good as me, right? And so no one would ever buy from me if I charge more than anyone else. When we talk about firms with market power, essentially what we mean is that there's a range of prices under which they'd be able to sell some amount of output, right? So they're gonna have a demand curve for their product it's downward sloping, right? So if you've got a downward sloping demand curve, you can sell some output for say $58 a ton, a little more for $57 a ton, a little less for $56 a ton, right? So what this is gonna mean is that prices aren't just gonna reflect essentially the, the equalization of supply and demand, they're also gonna reflect the decision of the firm about which of these prices they choose. This is really important to think about and understand because this is probably a more realistic description of the way most of the firms we know about make their decisions, right? Mo the situation most of the firms we know about find themselves in than the situation of being in a perfectly competitive market, right? If you're Apple, you have a lot of choices about what the price for your next cell phone is going to be, right? And you spend a lot of time thinking about what, what price you ought to choose. If you're Arsenal College, right, you can set your tuition. You have a range of options that have different consequences for you. You know, even if you're, um, you know, even if you're Walmart or Target or El Super, right, you can probably have a range of prices that you can sell, you know, avocados at without having your, your demand drop to zero. Cool. So this is what we're going to do, right? We're going to build a theory trying to understand how firms are making decisions when they have some control over the price that they're setting, and then thinking about the ramifications of that for society. Okay, so that's what market power is, right? Market power is the ability to choose the price at which you're gonna sell your product, right? In other words, the ability to sell at least some output at a whole range of different prices, rather than just at one single market price that you can't control. 
So why do some firms have market power and other firms don't have market power? In other words, what's the basis of market power? Well, to think about this, let's think about a couple of specific examples of a monopoly. One of the most famous and one of the oldest still existing monopolies is, you might have heard of it, the De Beers Diamond Company. So, you know, what the De Beers Diamond Company is, is essentially when the British invaded and conquered um, Southern Africa in the 19th century, this single British industrialist named Cecil Rhodes essentially seized control of all of the diamond reserves in, in South Africa, which have some of the largest diamond deposits in the world, and set up a corporation called the Beers Diamond Co Company that then controlled something like 80%, 85% of the world's diamond mines and of the world's diamond capacity. Even the small amount of diamonds that are mined outside of De Beers control tended to be sold to De Beers before they got sold to companies, right? So, right, so De Beers had something like 85% of the diamond industry And as a result, right, they had enormous market power over the price of diamonds. A lot of people have argued that diamonds aren't actually that rare. If we had competitive markets for diamonds, we would expect them to be probably a similar price as rubies or emeralds or other sorts of precious stones. But because they were all under the control of a single company, right, that company was able to sell diamonds well above um, you know, the, the competitive price of diamonds for over a century. So where did their monopoly come from? What power gave them this monopoly? Well, effectively, the power was that they had control of a key resource. Right? They owned all the diamond mines, and so as a result, they were able to set the price of diamonds. You might see the high price of diamonds and love to get into the diamond industry. You can't get into the diamond industry without owning any diamond mines. Cool. What's another example? Think about something a little bit closer to um, the present day. Maybe still not that close, right? So when I was growing up, you guys were either non-existent or very, very young. But in the late 1990s, early 2000s, Microsoft had almost total market dominance in um, operating systems for computers. In 2000, um, when they were sued for antitrust violations, they had 97% market share in computers, right? 3% were running Apple software, 97% of the world's computers were running Microsoft software. So that's very, very close to a monopoly, right? And as a result, they were able to sell their Microsoft software for very high prices, right? Something like $100, $200 for an operating system. So we've got Microsoft. So how did they have a monopoly? It's not because they control the key resource, right? It's not that um, they had high, you know, signed all of the computer programmers in the world to a long-term contract, or they had the only um, you know, CD fabrication, fabrication plant in the world. And it's not because nobody else could come up with an operating system either. Effectively, the reason that Microsoft had a monopoly is what we might call network effects. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you wanted to set up a competitor, right, or even if you were Apple, you were a competitor with 3% market share, if I'm designing software, I'm going to work really, really hard to make sure that my software works on Microsoft computers, because that's 97% of the market. Right? I'm going to care a lot about whether 97% of my consumers can use, your, can use my product. I'm not going to put that much effort into making sure that my product's compa compatible with Apple because that's only 3% of the market. So during this time, lots and lots and lots of software was exclusive to Microsoft, wasn't written to work for any other operating system. Right? So as a result, right, this is a feedback loop, right? Because if all the software writers are writing software that works on Microsoft computers, then as a consumer, I'm going to say, well, I ought to buy a Microsoft computer because all of the software works on Microsoft. Right? As a result, we basically get locked in. Right? Because all the consumers are using Microsoft, all the um, software writers are going to write for Microsoft, and because all the software writers are going to write for Microsoft, all the consumers are going to write for Microsoft. So this is very similar. Right? This is a very similar effect to what we might think of as market power in the world of social media today. 
where one of the big advantages that a company like Facebook and Instagram or a company like Twitter has is the fact that so many users are on those platforms, right? So as a result, there's content, right? If you want to see your um, cousin's engagement photos or baby pictures, those photos and pictures are being posted on the major social networks. They're not being posted on the minor social networks, right? So that's another example of these network effects. Okay. There's some companies, right, that have a monopoly without really seeming to have either of these things. So another example, if you live in Pennsylvania, and this is actually true in 17 different states. If you live in Pennsylvania or one of another 17 states, there's only one company owned by the government that is allowed to sell liquor, right? So if you're in Pennsylvania, you have to buy liquor from fine wine, goods, and spirits. If anyone else tries to sell you liquor, they're gonna to go to jail, right? So as a result, fine wine, goods, and spirits has a monopoly on the sale of liquor in the, sale of Pencil in the state of Pennsylvania, right? They have a lot of power to set prices. Why do they have that power? They are being ex given exclusive permission by the government. Right? So this is essentially a legally mandated monopoly. And there's lots and lots of examples, big and small, of companies that have market power protected through legal mandates by the government. Okay, cool, right? So these are three different reasons that you might have market power, right? You might control a key resource, you might benefit from network effects, right? Or economies of scale, essentially, the, you know, the larger you are, the more people use you, the more valuable you are to others. Or you might benefit from government protection. But if what we're asking about isn't just monopolies, but it's also market power, we need to add another category here. Because there's lots of companies that we would never describe as a monopoly that still have the power to set their prices. So what's an example? Well, if you're ever back on York, right, if you ever come back to campus, if you go down to York and 50th, there's three or four different fancy coffee places. Right, there's Kumquat Coffee, there's, um, oh, the other ones don't have as fun names, Cafe de Leche, right, there's all of these different places. They're all selling their coffee for something like $4 a cup. So why is Kumquat Coffee selling their coffee for $4 a cup? It's not because that's some market price that they can't control, right? They could totally sell coffee for $4.25 a cup. They could totally sell coffee for $3.75 a cup, right? That's a price that they're, that they're choosing. But they're not a monopoly. Right? They don't control all the coffee beans. They don't have benefit from economies of scale or network effects. And they certainly don't have government protection. Right? They've got competitors right on that block, right across the street. So the reason they have market power is because people care whether they're buying their coffee from Kumquat Coffee or from Cafe de Leche or from um, the other one, right? Eagle Rock Coffee or something. Right? People are willing to pay a few cents more for a cup of coffee from their favorite place. In other words, the reason they get market power is product differentiation. Right, Kumquat Coffee is selling a product that nobody else can exactly replicate because their product isn't just a cup of coffee. It's a cup of coffee with their special blend of cinnamon and cloves or whatever it is they do, right? With their particular mood music playing and their nice clean white lines and their fun name and their baristas with cool hats, right? Whatever it is, I, I don't go there very often, right? Whatever it is that they do, they've got a special something that no one else completely replicates. And as a result, people are willing to pay a different price to go to Kumquat Coffee than to go to another coffee place across the street. So an important point here, right, is that market power is distinct from our concept of monopoly, right? Having market power doesn't necessarily mean that you're a big company or that we think of you as a powerful company in other respects, right? It just means that you're a company that does something that no one else can exactly do. And likewise, right, just like you can have very, very small companies that have market power, you can have very, very large companies that really don't have very much market power. So my guess is that almost every one of you today has used a product made by the Unilever Corporation. 
This is the seventh largest company in the world. Makes um, most deodorant, toothpaste, um, you know, hairspray, hair gel, shampoo, soap, all sorts of different products under hundreds of different brand names. So you might think, okay, well, if Unilever is one of the biggest companies in the world, makes all of these different products, they can probably essentially set the price that they want for soap and hair gel and all this sort of stuff. But they really can't, right? They don't actually have that much power, even though they sell something like half of all the stuff in their product categories. And the reason is people don't care quite enough about buying one kind of toothpaste over another for them to be able to raise the prices that much higher over their smaller competitors, right? So even though they're an enormous company, they probably have less power to set their prices than Kumquat Coffee does, right? Likewise, if we think about suppliers of inputs, right? Companies like Foxconn, which is an enormous corporation, right? Or Intel, um, another enormous corporation that sells most of the computer chips that are used today, right? These companies are huge. They've got massive market share, but they have competitors who sell very, very similar products, right? You can have your products assembled at Foxconn. You can have your products assembled at a number of other smaller competitors that do a very similar kind of work as Foxconn. And so as a result, Foxconn doesn't have that much ability to raise their prices above what their competitors are charging. They also might have less market power than come more coffee. Okay, so what's the main point here? The main point is if you want to have market power, right? If you're looking for market power, you're going to have to have some, some ability to distinguish yourself from your competitors, right? Some reason that you can um, produce a product that no one else can produce that can either come from something like control of a resource or network effects on economies of scale. It can also come just from the fact that you have a unique and differentiated product. All right, great.